from the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Drones might be the newest security risk as the Super Bowl approaches. We take a look at just how effective Glendale police can be in enforcing the big game's no drone zone. Here at Cronkite News, we're tracking heroin's hold on Arizona. Today, we look at a new bill that can help first responders save heroin users' lives after an overdose. And we talked to a local high school marching band about an exciting opportunity to be part of the Super Bowl festivities. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Brittany Bain. And I'm Ryan Hill. Thank you for joining us tonight. Today, the FAA issued a warning on the use of drones during this weekend's Super Bowl. A no drone zone has been created for the University of Phoenix Stadium in Glendale. But the rules highlight a problem enforcing laws against drone usage. Our Cronkite News reporter Liliana Salgado is in Washington, D.C. with a look at whether stopping drones is feasible. A device similar to this one is the reason why. Secret Service got active and two rolled out and one bicycle went around and I'm assuming to the South Lawn. He assumes right. This is the drone that crashed on the South Lawn of the White House earlier this week, causing a lockdown. But it's not only here in Washington where drones are a concern. Local police in Arizona are preparing for the Super Bowl, and they say that if they see... Somebody operating a drone or in preparation of operating a drone, we will make contact and address the, the individual up to and including arrest. The question here is if Secret Service couldn't manage to keep a drone off of one of the most protected buildings of the country, how is it that local law enforcement will manage to enforce a no drone zone at the Super Bowl? John Franklin, founder of Drone Shield, a company that helps businesses keep drones away, doesn't see how enforcement will be possible. I don't see how local law enforcement can handle uh, you know, a drone in a stadium environment. President Obama commented on the issue after the incident at the White House. He too isn't sure how to work around the new technology. I've actually asked the FAA and a number of agencies to examine how are we managing uh, this new technology uh, because uh, the drone that landed in the White House you buy in Radio Shack. In Washington DC, Liliana Salgado, Cronkite News. And here's a closer look at the FAA's restrictions at the Super Bowl. Anybody flying a drone during the game faces a penalty of a fine or even jail time. A 10 mile radius covering the University of Phoenix Stadium also bans commercial airline traffic. So that means that Glendale, Goodyear, Phoenix Mesa Gateway will not be operating from noon to midnight during the day of the big game. Super Bowl security is already falling into place for this weekend's big game, including equipment from our southern border and hundreds of officers and agents being brought to the valley for extra protection. I sat down with the Secretary of Homeland Security to talk about his department's efforts and what their concerns are heading into the weekend. What's your biggest fear for this weekend? My biggest fear for this weekend is that we go into overtime. Secretary of Homeland Security Jay Johnson is kidding, of course. I believe that we will have a safe and successful Super Bowl this Sunday. Secretary Johnson's belief is one shared by many. Clearly, uh, security's here. I think people are walking around feeling pretty safe. At Super Bowl Central in downtown Phoenix, the security presence is impossible to miss. Bag checks at the gate, surveillance up above. You see, we saw a lot of people walking with the security black shirts and khaki pants. More than 7,000 local, state, and federal law enforcement officers will be protecting the valley this weekend. And it's not just people. Helicopters and other equipment have been brought up from the border. In the nature of surveillance screening equipment, uh, canines. In this case, equipment missing from the border is okay. That does not divert too much away from our border security mission. According to the secretary, the border and the big games events are safe and secure, leaving some people with another thing to worry about. Finally here and I don't have a ticket. Secretary Johnson says there are no credible terrorist threats against the Super Bowl and the threat level has been the same for the past 10 years. 
Super Bowl week is in full swing, but with all the fans and football come some serious side effects, like human trafficking. Cronkite News reporter Nihal Krishan is live in Washington, D.C. to see how, the moving, how Congress is moving fast to protect the potential victims. Nihal? In two days and with little debate, House members approved 12 bills related to trafficking this week. Many representatives said they were pushing to ensure that the spotlight now on the Super Bowl also shines on the dangers that come with it. And they usually look at an event like the Super Bowl uh, as, a, as a magnet, and they flock there uh, to sell these women and to exploit these women and young girls. Uh, so all of us need to have zero tolerance when it comes uh, to this kind of uh, exploitation. Among the proposals pushed through were one that would make fighting trafficking a priority for the Department of Homeland Security, another to boost penalties for those connected to trafficking, and also one to increase training for federal workers who deal with the problem. Experts hope that the Senate will take up these issues now after letting the bill die in last session's Congress. We have seen over the past couple of years a tremendous growth in public awareness that this is a serious problem that we need to tackle inside our own country. And in that respect, these, these steps through the House are very welcome. The Phoenix uh, law enforcement and the larger Phoenix metropolitan area has been incredibly active. In fact, the whole state has really been quite active in fighting sex trafficking in their state. Arizona leaders have been working on the issue for months now, with Mayor Greg Stanton, Cindy McCain, and others leading the charge. McCain was here in Washington just this week in advance of a summit on the issue with leaders from around the country. Live in Washington, this is Nihal Krishan, Cronkite News. Another group getting more informed about human trafficking, attorneys and prosecutors here in the Valley. Cronkite News reporter Imelda Mejia joins us with an inside look at a presentation to legal leaders today. Just days before the Super Bowl, attorneys and prosecutors from Arizona gathered to learn about human trafficking and hear the story of one woman who says she endured what no child ever should. From Phoenix, Arizona. This is where I was trafficked at. Carolyn Jones is making an appeal to the legal community. This is where all of my hurt, my pain, and my shame went on in the streets of Phoenix. She told her story as part of a seminar put together by the State Bar of Arizona. Its mission, to address and explore the issue of human trafficking affecting our own community. I mean, there's a lot of debate as to, you know, whether the Super Bowl is the number one human trafficking event in, in the country. So it makes sense to talk about it this week. Um, and not the least of which, it's not inconceivable that some of the prosecutors who'd be, who could be coming to this event today may be prosecuting these cases in the weeks to come. The human trafficking seminar was put on for those in the legal profession, but it spoke to them as ordinary citizens. My focus for doing this was primarily to understand the issue more. I thought that that was pretty interested and interesting, and I, so I thought I would come in to see more about it and learn more about the statistics. According to the Trafficking Resource Center, the amount of victims quadrupled to 20,650 between 2008 and 2012. Attendees linked those numbers to past Super Bowl cases and learned the common indicators of human trafficking. But perhaps the biggest takeaway was Carolyn's story. I didn't want to grow up and be a prostitute, a drug addict. I wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to make people better. I wanted to be a real nurse. You know what? I am a nurse, but I'm a different type of nurse. I am a nurse. I get to work with young girls. Carolyn continues on her mission to help young girls who have been trafficked by sitting on the Governor's Council for Human Trafficking and Streetlight USA. Live in the Broadcast Center, Imelda Mejia, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is dedicated to tracking heroin's hold on Arizona. When we come back, we take a look at a plan to give first responders a new power to help save lives in case of an overdose. And a new study looks at the economic effect of the Colorado River that it has on the state and those who live here. At ASU, we believe the most important semester is the one that starts after you get your diploma, the one called life. So we work hard to help our alumni thrive, teaching them the importance of not only achieving their goals, but exceeding them with innovative programs that embrace hands-on learning that encourages real-world growth. Our alumni know it can be the education of a lifetime for a lifetime. 
For more information, thrive.asu.edu. Should I believe in the world, Mama? I think so. Should I give up and hide or should I stay and fight? Should I believe in the rules, Mama? What are the consequences? Can I speak out my mind in these changing times? I don't know what to believe, Mama. Will you march with us? There's a fire inside. There's a storm on the rise. You need a reason to be, Mama. Buonasera. is more complicated than it's ever been. The news hour is always going to take you deeper and take you broader. And that is worth fighting for. Night after night, seven days a week. I'm Maria Hinojosa. I'm Gwen Eiffel. And I'm Judy Woodruff. On behalf of all of us here, thanks for watching. It is estimated that 1,000 people across Arizona may have been exposed to measles since the first case was recorded this year and was brought back from Disneyland. Two or more Arizona citizens have been diagnosed with measles, including a woman in Phoenix and a man from Pinal County. The Arizona Department of Health is encouraging everyone who believes that they have measles to take precaution to avoid getting others sick. If you feel that you may have been affected, avoid going to urgent care centers. Contact your health care provider by phone, and if you must visit an emergency center, call ahead and warn them of your arrival. As part of Cronkite News' initiative to continue tracking heroin's hold on Arizona, Cronkite News reporter Angeline Meehan reports a House bill may one day allow all EMTs and peace officers to administer a life-saving drug. If we have a person who's unconscious, breathing, you know, three to four times a minute. Captain Joel Navarro has saved many lives with naloxone. All of a sudden, he's back up, he's alert, his eyes opened up. Um, and he's starting to breathe normal. The antidote temporarily reverses the effects of a heroin overdose. And if House Bill 2489 one day becomes a law, all emergency medical technicians and police officers will be able to administer this life-saving opioid antagonist. Representative Heather Carter introduced and sponsors this bill. She says Arizona needs to join other states in passing similar legislation. And we thought that it would be appropriate for Arizona to join those group of states so that we can potentially save lives um, when we have situations of overdose in Arizona. HB 2489 is already gaining support from those who work with addicts. Haley Coles is a founding member of Sonoran Prevention Works, an outreach group that helps those suffering from drug addictions. I think that getting naloxone into as many hands as possible is um, like a really good way to start combating this overdose epidemic. Erica Heckman runs a teen drug rehab facility and says this is a good first step to fight overdoses while scientists work on more effective treatments for addiction. I think that we can't rely on uh, just this idea that if you know you're going to die, you're going to stop using, because reality is the addiction to heroin is much more powerful than that. Captain Joel Navarro sees the immediate advantages. It's a very simple drug to administer, um, and you know if they have statewide training for especially police officers and other EMTs, um, that could make a difference, truly. Giving first responders another weapon in the fight against heroin. In Phoenix, Angela Meehan, Cronkite News. According to the Network of Public Health Law's website, at least 15 states allow peace officers to carry naloxone as of July 2014, including California and Massachusetts. A new bill in the Arizona House might bring restrictions for teen tanning bed users. If passed, HB 2493 would require all customers at tanning salons to show a photo ID at their arrival. Employees would not be allowed to let anyone under the age of 18 into their facilities. The bill also proposes requiring tanning salons to keep record of every customer who uses a tanning bed, including their name, age, and as well as the date, time, and length of their visit. A bill ha which has been assigned to a committee does, does not apply to tanning beds in private residences. Both, the ch both chambers of Arizona State Legislature are also proposing a new day of awareness. HCR 1017, this is August 27th, as this year's Concussion Awareness Day. The text of the resolution recognizes that at least 10% of young athletes in the state are affected by concussions and the importance of outreach and education programs for medical professions to recognize when a player has one. 
The resolution is on its way to the Rules Committee right now. Historic buildings on one street in downtown Phoenix may soon be demolished. But residents have their own plan and they're not going down without a fight. We're live from the protest to save Roosevelt Row. You're watching Cronkite News now airing on 8HD. The more you know about history, the more you know about yourself. Let's turn the page. I believe that this nation should commit itself. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. You can almost divide American history before Robinson and after Robinson. Seeing is believing. We broke records, we broke barriers. This is incredible. Suddenly the big picture makes more sense. We have unprecedented access. Now I can see it's my ancestors. Now I'm looking into their world. Now I can see where they walked. The Arts District in downtown Phoenix is facing future developments that aren't sitting well with some of the residents in the community. Cronkite News reporter Jamie Warren is live on Roosevelt Row, where a protest is expected within the hour. Jamie? The protest is expected to start at about 545, but first protesters will be meeting here at about 530 at what's known as the Bodega House. Now, this is just one of multiple buildings on Roosevelt Row that could potentially be replaced by apartment units. By day, the Arts District on Roosevelt Row is full of color. It's not Ahwatukee. I mean, it's not North Scottsdale. This is downtown Phoenix. It's urban. And by night, <laughs> Music fills the streets as a community gathers every Wednesday on the front porch of a house that means a lot to Arizona native Adrian Fontes. I had a business here and my office is still in the building. Many of the buildings on Roosevelt Row have a lot of history. But now some of the same buildings that make the city unique face a unique problem of their own. We think adding apartment units to uh, to downtown is absolutely critical. Developers for new apartment buildings have plans to demolish greenhouse boutique and gallery along with other buildings on the arts market block. <laughs> One of them being Adrian's favorite hangout spot. It's a tragedy that someone would be willing to right here create a four-story monolithic uh, really generic block. Since the buildings aren't categorized as historic landmarks, the city of Phoenix says there's nothing it can do. As long as they meet, again, all the, the zoning ordinance and, and codes, they're good to go. But it doesn't come without hesitation. I think the bigger issue, though, is, is really about striking that balance and trying to figure it out. And it's hard. It really is hard. Hard for those like Adrian, who says many have worked hard to establish the neighborhood's unique sense of community. Protesters are expected to dress in funeral attire as a part of a symbolic funeral procession, and they'll make their way down Roosevelt to about Central and then along the light rail. Live in downtown Phoenix, Jamie Warren, Cronkite News. We began this week with a bit of rain, and today's clouds look like they might be bringing more rain over the weekend. Angelina Mahain uh, takes a look at this upcoming forecast. As you can see on the satellite radar map, we've had overcast skies throughout the state with rain coming in from the south. Let's take a look at your current temperature here in Phoenix. It is 69 degrees, still cloudy out there. No rain yet, but humidity is at, at 41 percent, and that's only going to increase as the day progresses. Let's take a look at your current temperatures throughout the valley. In the East Valley, Mesa is at 68 degrees. Over there on the West Valley, Goodyear is at 68 degrees as well. Let's take a look at your state temperatures. Up in, the, up in the high country, it's a little cooler with Winslow at 55 degrees. Down there in Tucson, a little warmer at 66 degrees. Highs not much higher than they are right now with Huma at 79 degrees. Tonight, it's going to dip down to 62 degrees. Around midnight, we're going to experience showers, and that rainfall is only going to continue into tomorrow. It's going to be a wet one all day tomorrow, and that rain's going to continue into Saturday, so definitely have an umbrella on hand this weekend. But we're going to have clear skies, and it'll be a little warmer just in time for the big game on Sunday. 
and Monday should be a lot clearer and warmer in the upper 70s. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Angela Meehan. Thanks, Angelie. The first ever economic study of the Colorado River was published, giving us a look into just how much the lower basin states would be affected by a water shortage. Cronkite News reporter Loris Bizzotto sat, sat down with the lead economist on a study to learn what the impact would be on businesses. The study was done for Protect the Flows by the W.P. Carey School of Business, and it helps place a number on just how important this Colorado River system is. In Arizona alone, two million jobs depend on it annually. Court Fetter and his wife own the only paddleboard shop in the state. We probably see probably three, four hundred people a week. Fetter says he owes most of his success to the bodies of water here in Arizona. Uh, a large portion of our rental uh, business is keyed and zoned towards the Colorado River. A new study by Protect the Flows says that the Colorado River generates nearly $1.4 trillion annually. Professor Tim James says that economically it impacts everyone. The numbers tell you that the sectors which would suffer most as a result of water availability reductions would be things that you wouldn't really expect. The study says that the Colorado River provides over 16 million jobs and that if the river dried up, Arizona would lose more than $870 billion in labor. And that's just for one year. Water just doesn't come out of the tap. Although Protect the Flow study has gained a lot of recognition in the past few days, there are some who say that the research just isn't that realistic. There's a lot of water law that, that is all set up to determine when there are reductions to water, how those reductions take place. The software used for the study based its calculations off the assumption that the river would dry up completely. The authors acknowledge in the report that that's vanishingly unlikely. But both agree that responsible water usage is necessary for more businesses than just fetters. With any kind of water shortage that would definitely impact us and may shut us down. According to levels at Lake Mead, we are currently less than 15 feet away from a light water shortage. Live in the Media Center, Laura Spazzato, Cronkite News. Some Valley high schoolers are getting their chance to entertain Super Bowl fans at the stadium. We take a look at how they got this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This week, Cronkite News is proud to join the Arizona PBS News Block here on 8HD. Here's a look at what's coming up tonight on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. Coming up next after Cronkite News, it's Arizona Horizon. Former Ambassador Kurt Volker makes his regular appearance to discuss foreign affairs. And we'll talk about how and why the Valley is able to grab so many mega sporting events. I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour, the economics of betting the odds this Super Bowl weekend. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. Move over Katy Perry. Two Valley High School marching bands have been asked to perform on Super Bowl Sunday. Cronkite News reporter Sydney Schumann visited one of the schools, Desert Vista High School, as students prepare for the big day. Yes, Desert Vista High School marching band is not new to high-profile events. They have won either first or second state championships the past six years. But this Sunday, they have a very unique honor. They have been asked to perform during the tailgate before the Super Bowl. Desert Vista High School band director Josh T. couldn't be more upbeat about his students. They go into every show with, with um, uh, just a lot of hard work, uh, but also a real determination. And they impress me. That's for sure. The marching band, which has about 130 students, is comprised of freshmen through seniors. 
offering older students an opportunity to mentor those who are younger. So it's some students doing it for the very first time, um, side by side with students that's their fourth year. And it comes down to you know that mentorship and the, the older students helping the younger students. Planners for the Super Bowl pregame approached team months ago about this opportunity to play. Marching band president Katie Smith found out from her teacher early and was hard pressed to keep this supersized secret. For me, I'm like, let's go to the Super Bowl. Let's do this. Like, I'm excited. I'm, but I can't tell anyone, so I have to like hold my excitement in. But I'm like, I'm on the Super Bowl. So when T finally made the big announcement, everyone was really surprised at first. It was kind of like quiet, like really, right? And then he was all like. Yeah, and, and then later, like after class, everyone was like freaking out and talking and like telling parents and stuff like that, texting in school. It's crazy. He sounded casual, but to the rest of us were like, oh my god, the Super Bowl! They've been working hard to get together and practice when they can in their off season, but Teen knows his band is ready. The students have, have really worked hard. Desert Vista High School Marching Band is also performing right now at the NFL Experience in downtown Phoenix Convention Center. And the big show is Sunday during the tailgate on the east side of the stadium. The other Valley School to win the tailgate concert honor is Mountain Ridge High School. I'm Sydney Schumann, Cronkite News. And that's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Find top Arizona stories anytime at cronkitenewsonline.com.